Hello everyone, this is Raza Dharani. Welcome to my channel. In this video, I will show you 25 Power Automate Flow tips and tricks and features that every flow maker needs to be aware of. So ready, steady, let's flow. Out here in the flow maker portal at flow.microsoft.com, the first tip is about the different types of flows that you can create. So if I head over to the create option right here on the left hand navigation, you are presented with five different types of flows. The first flow is called an automated cloud flow. And these flows are triggered automatically based on a designated event. And that event based upon the trigger action for a specific connector. There are some commonly used automated cloud flow triggers that are presented right here. For example, Microsoft Forms. When a user creates a new response, I can trigger this flow. Or when an item is created in a SharePoint list, or when a file is created in OneDrive. You can also search for a specific connector. For example, I can search for SharePoint and this will list out all those automated triggers related to SharePoint. The second type of flow is called an instant cloud flow or a manual flow or a button flow. And these flows are triggered manually. The flow trigger button that you can trigger manually from your mobile device. You can trigger a flow from Power Apps. You can call a flow from Power Virtual Agents. All of these are manual because it involves a user action. So in case of Power Apps, I have to click a button in Power Apps to call the flow. In case of OneDrive, I have to select a file in my OneDrive and start the flow. The third type of flows are called scheduled cloud flows. These flows will trigger based on a schedule that you define. So you can run your flows monthly, weekly, daily. You can even go down to the extent of selecting which days and at which time would you like your flow to trigger. The fourth type of flow are called desktop flows. And these flows can perform robotic process automation capabilities for your desktop apps or apps on the web by leveraging the flow designer, which is Power Automate Desktop. Once you have Power Automate Desktop installed, I can straight away go and launch the Power Automate Desktop app and I can start creating my robotic process automation flows wherein I can record and replay my actions. The fifth type of flow is known as the business process flows and these type of flows guides you through a multi-step process. So you can define your flow steps as you move through a process. These type of flows are tied in with Microsoft Dataverse, formerly known as the Common Data Service. You have to have your tables created in Microsoft Dataverse. I have to associate my business process flow with one of the tables in Microsoft Dataverse. The second flow tip is around using templates. Now right here in the create experience itself, there are various templates provided with different categorizations. For example, there are approval based templates which contains flows involving the approval action. You can also search for templates. I search for templates related to attachments. And this will light up all those templates that have been created specific to attachments in any data service. SharePoint Outlook are a few examples. So right here I have a flow template to save my email attachments to my OneDrive. And if I just select this, the first step is I have to connect to all the connectors that are leveraged in the flow. So I need to connect to Outlook and to OneDrive. And once I have my connections established, I can just go ahead and create the flow. And this flow is live and ready to go. I can head over to edit and look at all the actions that this flow is presenting me as part of the template. Templates are extremely powerful because you don't have to reinvent the wheel. The third tip is around creating flows. When we start creating flows, we need to pick the trigger or the flow type. Now, if you're confused as to which trigger or which flow type do you need, if I pick any of the first three options here, let's say I pick the automated cloud flow, I have an option here to skip the trigger completely. So if I click skip, this takes me directly to the flow creation experience. And right here I'm presented with all of the connectors. And these are all the connectors that allow me to connect to my data services. So if I'm looking out for any sort of trigger around SharePoint, I can just search for SharePoint. 
select the SharePoint connector and here are all the triggers that are available as part of the SharePoint connector. Let's say I pick the connector when an item is created in SharePoint. That's the trigger action that gets set up. And if I would like to change this, I can just go to the three ellipses, delete the step, and once again, I'm presented with options to choose any trigger of my choice. The fourth tip is around the connectors. Now here I have a list of all the connectors. And the way I can search for connectors is literally by searching for the connector name. For example, if I'm looking for connectors around Microsoft Teams, if I search for Microsoft Teams, here is the Microsoft Teams connector. And if I select this, here are all the triggers associated with this connector. And here are all the actions associated with this connector. You have the classification of the connectors right here. So I have built-in connectors, which is the Flow Mobile, Power Apps, Power Virtual Agents, and so on and so forth. I can even look at some standard connectors and standard connectors are those connectors that do not require any premium licensing costs. Premium connectors are connectors that require you to have a premium license. Custom connectors are any custom connectors that are created as part of your environment. Now tip number five is around renaming actions and naming your flows. So here I have a flow which basically starts an approval process when an item is created in a SharePoint list and the approval action goes to the user's manager for approval. These action names are the default names of those actions. The best practice here is to rename those actions to the actual function that you're trying to perform so that the maintainability aspect of your flow improves. So for example, the action says start an approval. Now, if I was to leave this organization and some other user was to come and take control of this approval process flow, now start an approval for the user's manager. Now I have to open this, look at the actions and understand what's going on here. So best practice, always rename your flow actions. So I can call this start manager approval. The moment you add your action, go ahead and rename the action. Here is another example. I have three send an email actions. And if you look at the action name, it does not give any insights as to what is the functionality behind this email action. So in this case, I'm sending an email for the project status report. In this case, there's an email for a task reminder. So if you rename your flow actions to the function that the action is performing, it improves the maintainability aspect of your flow. Also the flow itself, name the flow based on the action that the flow is performing. Now in my case here, this is my flow for Power Automate flow tips. You can even include emojis here. And then when I head over to my flows, if I need to search for my flows, if I've named them right, I can easily search for them. So if I search for tips, I have a couple of flows that have the word tips in their titles. The next tip is around adding comments to your actions. Now comments and actions can be very handy once again from a maintainability standpoint. And you can also plug in the expressions if you have used those in your actions. Now here I have an action to get all the items from my SharePoint list. Now if I just purely look at this action, it seems like this action will get all the data from my SharePoint list. But if I go to show advanced options, I notice that there's a filter query right here which says, go ahead and filter the data from this data source where the due date column is less than or equal to, and here's an expression. If I select this, it shows me the expression, UTC now, that is today's date and time. So basically, get me all the items where the due date has passed. Had the maker of this flow just added a comment here or maybe entered the actual functionality itself in the name of this action, it would have been much easier to understand. For example, get items past due date. Or I can go to the three ellipses and go and add a comment right here. Now you don't want the action names to be very large because if you use it in expressions later, it might get a bit complex. So keep your action names small and utilize comments to the fullest. The next tip is around copying and pasting actions. So every action that you add in your flow, you have the option of going to three ellipses and you can straight away go and copy this action. Now this action that I just copied is available on my clipboard for my current browser session. If I go ahead and try and insert an action again, and this time head over to my clipboard, I see that action available right here. So I can just go ahead and paste this. I can even go to a completely different flow, add a new step, 
go to my clipboard and it will be available for my browser session. Now, if you want to use this in a flow in a different tenant or in a different browser, if I just open my notepad and do a control V, that's after me copying my action to my clipboard. If I just do a control V, I get the code behind that action and I can go ahead and save this. So here's me accessing a flow by refreshing my browser cache. If I go to new step and my clipboard, don't see my clipboard content that I had copied. However, now if I go back to that notepad and just copy this, come right here, just click here and control V, it will paste that action right here. You can use this for sharing flow snippets. The next tip is around using scopes. Now scope is a very powerful action in Power Automate. One of its features is the ability for you to group actions to better organize your flows. So if you look at this flow right now, I have grouped actions into a scope action. And to create a scope action, I can just go to add an action, search for scope, and here is a scope action. And the beauty of the scope action is that you can move actions, so like select, drag, and drop them right here. So you can move actions. You can even have a scope inside a scope. And scopes help to organize your flows, specifically for large flows. The next tip is around using the compose action versus creating a variable in flow. In flow, when you want to use a variable, the first step is you have to initialize your variable. So let's say I create a variable, I give my variable a name, variables are strongly typed. When you create a variable, you have to pick the type of that variable. You have multiple options here to choose from. In my case, let's say I pick a variable of type string, I initialize it to an empty value. You cannot initialize variable actions in scopes. You have to keep them out of the scope, initialize them, and then you can use them throughout your flow plus you also have the option of updating those variable values. If I look at the variable actions, I can append to an array variable, I can increment or decrement a variable, and I can go ahead and set its value. So variables are useful when you want to change its value throughout the course of the flow run. On the other side, we have an action called compose. And compose can store any type of data. So you don't have to define what is the type of your data. So if I just type Reza, it understands that it's a string. If I just type a number, it understands that it's a number. So it can define your data types dynamically. Also, compose is a lot faster than variables. The compose action is more like a static variable, a variable whose value does not change during the course of the flow run. So if you need static variables, use the compose action. If you need variables that are going to change during the course of your flow run, then in that case, go ahead and use the variable action. The next tip is around the expression editor and enabling experimental features. Now in flow for every action, you can include expressions. So if I just click inside the compose action here, I have the option here to pick dynamic content, which are basically the attributes that any preceding action in flow exposes, or I can head over and start plugging in expressions and with expressions, we can do a lot of basic things in flow, like converting values, comparing values. Now the expression editor here has a very limited space to play with. So if I go ahead and plug in a long expression here, in order for me to look at the entire expression, I literally have to just move through this. So there's not enough real estate here to play with. So what I'll recommend is go ahead and turn on the experimental feature right here. So go to settings on the top, view all power automate settings and select the experimental feature and turn this on. When you turn on the experimental feature, bear in mind that your browser window will refresh. And once the browser window refreshes, now if I go to my compose action and click right here, you will note that I don't see that option for dynamic content or expression. I can select this for dynamic content and I can select this for plugging in my expressions in this wide expression box. There's also a nice link here that will take you to the list of all the functions that are available classified right here on the right hand side. So if you're looking for string function based expressions, just click on this, pick any of the expressions here. You want to concatenate strings, select this. It's going to give you the syntax. It's going to give you an example. Very useful. Now the next tip is how to generate a URL for a flow run. Now as part of your flow, it will list out 
all the runs of your flow. So every time my flow runs, it logs that right here. I can select my flow run and look at all the actions and how they were performed and what were the input and output values for each of those actions. So let's say a few of my flow runs failed or if I would like to directly get to a specific run for a specific record, in that case, I would have to go through all the list of flow runs and search for my record. And if I select a specific flow run, you will see that each flow run has a specific URL associated with it. It has the environment name right here, it has the ID of the flow, and it has the run specific good that it generates. Now, if you would like to generate that within your flow itself so that you can store it in your system of record, so that I can just click on that link and it takes me directly to the flow run. You can do that through expressions. And this is what the expression looks like. I'm gonna concatenate my flow URL. Please note, I'm in the US region. So I am plugging in us.flow.microsoft.com. This is how I can grab my environment name. This is how I can grab my flow name. And this is how I can grab the current flow run good. I will plug this expression in the description of this video so you can just straight away go copy this and utilize it. Now tip number 12 is around something known as trigger conditions. Here I have a flow that gets triggered when a record is created in a SharePoint list called travel requests. Now this flow will get called every time a record is created in that list. But maybe I would like to only call my flow when a record is created and a specific condition is met. I have a column known as estimated airfare and this gives me the cost of the estimated airfare for the travel request. Now maybe I want to start the approval process only if this estimated airfare is greater than $500. For that, I can add a very simple condition expression. So I can go to my expression here and I can add an expression that says greater than or equal to the value which is my estimated airfare. So if this is greater than or equal to 500. And if I click out, that's my expression. Now, if I just go ahead and copy this expression, I can go to three ellipses and head over to settings. Right here, we have an option for trigger conditions. So if I click on add, I can plug in that expression right here. And bear in mind, when you write expressions right here, they have to begin with the at symbol. So I've just placed the at symbol. If I click done, now I've added a trigger condition in which my flow will only begin or only trigger when the estimated airfare of the record created in this list is greater than 500. Now what's the advantage? One, I'm only triggering my flow as and when needed. Two, with flows, there is something known as API limits. So if I head over to aka.ms slash service limits, this will take me to the request limits and allocations documentation. And bear in mind that there are limits to how many API calls you can make in a 24 hour period. So it's important to keep your API calls limited. And for that, one of the key things that you could apply are trigger conditions so that you only trigger your flows as and when needed. The next tip is around using peak code to grab expressions or look at the code behind any of the actions. So right here, I have my get manager action. If I want to look at the code, the actual code behind this, I can go to three ellipses here and go to peak code. And this will now show me the code behind this specific action. It's using a get request against this API. So if you want to deep dive into what's going on in the back end, you can do so using peak code. Another good use case of peak code right here, I added my expression. Now if I want to grab the expression, I can just go to three ellipses, go to peak code, and here is my complete expression in the input parameter. The next tip is on the apply to each loop. Now right here in my flow, I have my get items action to get all the items from my SharePoint list based on the due date. And my next step is I'm looping through all the items of my SharePoint list that is being returned based on my query. And I'm adding those items into a table in an Excel file in my OneDrive. Now if I was to go ahead and just run this flow manually, as the flow runs, how long does every action take is also tracked. So if you look at my loop scope, the get items action took one second and then the apply to each loop, there were three items returned. So this loop ran three times and it took five seconds for this to run. However, go back to that apply to each loop and go to its settings. 
there is a feature here wherein I can turn on concurrency control. Basically, I can loop through multiple items at once, a maximum of 50. 50 loop actions will execute concurrently. And this will speed up the process of my apply to each loop. Let's go ahead and test this out. And as you can see right now, the speed has increased. Now, I've taken a simple example wherein I only have three records. Imagine a scenario wherein you're dealing with hundreds of records. You can speed up your process right here by just enabling this concurrency feature for the apply to each loop. Now inside the apply to each loop, if your logic requires your items to be processed in a specific order, then enabling concurrency might not be a good idea. Specifically for cases in which you are updating a variable. Because the loops are running concurrently, there is a very high chance that your variables might return inaccurate results. So in those scenarios, ensure that you don't turn on the concurrency feature. The next tip is around number formatting. Now in Flow, when you're dealing with numbers, there is an action called format number. And for this action, all you have to provide is a number value and then pick one of the predefined formats. I've added three formats. One, where I just have a number which I will format. Next, I have a number and I'm defining my own custom format. So you can also pick the custom format and define any format of your choice. I'm defining a USA phone number format. And finally, I'm picking the out of the box currency format. Now, if I run this flow and we look at the output of all of these actions, here's my number. It's formatted right here based on two decimal places because that's the formatting that I defined. If I look at my custom format that I defined, here is the number that I provided and it formatted it right here. And finally, for the currency, here's the number that was provided and here is the result in US dollars. The next tip is around date formatting and converting time zones. Now you can write expressions for these. However, there is an action available for us. And for that, if I just search for date time, here's the date time option. And these are the list of actions that are made available for us. You can add to time, convert time zone, get the current time, future time. A lot of pre-built actions are available for us right here. Now the convert time zone action is extremely powerful. Here are two cases that I've created using that action. For the demo here, I'm using the expression UTC now, which gets me the current date and time. Next, you can define the format and there are multiple date formats here that you can choose from. Next is the source time zone. Bear in mind, Flow always understands dates and times in UTC format. So I'm picking coordinated universal time. And my destination time zone is any time zone that I would like to convert this date and time to. Now, if you just want to convert the format of your date, in that case, you can keep the source and destination the same. Or if you want to actually convert it to your own time zone, in my case, I am in the central time US. So I'm picking the central time zone right here. And if we look at the flow run right here, here is the output that the first action provided to me. This is the date and time and the format that I defined in UTC time. And here is the date and time output format that I defined and also converted the time zone. So this is right now in central standard time. And this is when I am recording this video. The next tip is around using the data operations action. Now, if I search for data operations, there are some very powerful actions that we can play with. Now, one of them was the compose action. There are other useful actions here, like create CSV table. So you can create a CSV table from an array of data and you can plug that in an Excel file, or you can create an HTML table on the fly. You can filter arrays, you can join data, you can parse JSON, you can select specific columns from an array. These are extremely powerful operations that you can leverage. So right here, I'm getting the items from my SharePoint list known as work progress tracker. Now let's say I want to email myself an HTML table of the data that's returned from this action. Basically all the work tasks that are overdue. So for this, I can use the create HTML table action provided an array the array here, I'll pick it from the dynamic content output of my get items action. And I can go to show advanced options. Automatic will pick all the columns. If I want to pick specific columns, I can even do that. I can go to custom and say, I want to pick specific columns. 
and you can also give the header names of that table that gets created. So I want title and the value for this will come from the title column in my get items action. So I'm just leveraging the title and description values from this list and generating a table on the fly. Next, I can just go ahead and send an email. And in the body of my email, I'll go to dynamic content and pick the output of my HTML table action. Let's go ahead and test this flow. Now, once the flow run completes, here is the email that I received. And here is all that tabular data of the tasks that are overdue. And here is the three records that are overdue. And those are exactly the three records that are provided to me right here. I can even format this table. The next tip is around something known as parallel branching. So you can basically run actions in parallel as well. Needless to say, when you do so, ensure that there is no dependency between the actions and those parallel branches. That's because each of those parallel branches will run simultaneously. And to add a parallel branch, you can just go to insert and add a parallel branch. So let's say I have my date time scope right here. I would like to run my error handling scope as well in parallel to this. I can place the scope right here and these two actions now will run in parallel when the flow executes. The next tip is around error handling. Now in flow for every action, you can just go to three ellipses and you'll get a property called configure run after. Now by default, every action that you add runs if it's preceding action is successful. So it always assumes that the previous action is successful. But what if it fails? Or what if that action is skipped or timed out? you can select any of those scenarios here. So I can say that run the step only if the previous action has failed or run this if the previous has failed or is successful. So you can define the configure run after settings for each and every action in your flow. Now we spoke about scopes earlier. Additionally, you can also do configure run after on scopes and create scenarios like try catch. I have a scope called try. I have a couple of actions in there. And then I have another scope called catch, wherein I have other actions and I'm sending an email notification to the user. And right here for this scope action, I can go to configure run after and define that this action will run only if the previous action has failed. So if any of these actions fail, this action will come alive. Now, as part of my flow, I have purposely created an expression that's going to fail. So this action will fail. The catch block will come alive. I go and grab the error value. I'm using all the tips that I gave earlier. I'm using all those data operations right here to generate the error code, create an HTML table. Then I'm formatting this table and I'm also generating a link directly to the flow run using expressions. So let's go ahead and run this flow. Now, once this flow runs, if I open the error handling block, you will see that the try action has failed. Now, because I handled the error, please note flow does not handle errors automatically. You have to do error handling. If an error occurs, the flow just stops. Here I have handled the error. I have a catch block wherein I'm grabbing the details of the error and sending a notification email to the flow creator. So if I head over to my mail, I get an email that tells me that here's the error in my flow run. I even get the error message that I've grabbed and here's a link directly to my flow run. If I click this, it will directly take me to that instance of my flow run. So I can then just go and evaluate what the error was. Now the next tip is around using the flow checker. Now when you build flows, flow checker is your friend. As I go and save this flow, if there is any errors that the flow has to highlight or any warnings in the flow checker, as I build my flow, I can even click on the flow checker and see if there are any issues. So right now the flow is warning me that there is an action in this flow that may result in an infinite trigger loop. So that's something that I need to handle as part of my flow. The flow here triggers when an item is created or modified in a specific SharePoint list. And then I am updating that same item in that SharePoint list. So what's going to happen? The flow triggers, the flow updates the item, the update item re-triggers the flow and this runs into an infinite loop and this will consume all my API calls. And that's why the flow checker is clearly warning me about it. So flow checker is your friend as you're building your flows, ensure that you always keep an eye on it. Now, next tip is around testing your flows. 
So when you want to test your flows, there's an option right here called test. Now in my case, because it's a manually triggered flow, of course I can manually run it right here, or I can even go and pick automatic and pick any previous flow run. So if there was a specific scenario that resulted in an error, and maybe you've made the fix to the flow, you would like to run it again, you can do so right here by choosing that failed step. Or you can pick any of the previous flow runs and rerun your flow. The next tip is around adding a second owner for your flows. So if you look at this flow, I only have one owner, that's me. If I head over to edit, adding a second owner to your business critical flows is very important. If for some reason, Reza was to leave the organization or my account would be deactivated, then this flow would stop working. To transfer the ownership of the flow then would require some administrative work. However, if there was a second owner defined for the flow, that owner could take control of the flow and the flow would keep running. So let's say I pick a user Sarah. The moment I pick a second user to be the owner of my flow, flow will give me a warning and that warning is that all the connections that I'm leveraging in this flow would be shared with that user in the context of this flow. That means through this flow, Sarah has the same rights to SharePoint that I do. And that's the warning that's being provided right here. So this is very important to understand from a security standpoint. Ideally, create a service account and that service account could be your secondary owner for your business critical flows. Next tip is around exporting and importing flows. So if I go to the flow details page right here, if you want to share your flow with other users, don't make them owners. You have a couple of options. One is you can send a copy of your flow to any user in your organization. So right here, let's say I pick Sarah. Here are my Power Automate flow tips. Now click on send. Sarah will receive an email, which will have this flow as a template. The moment she clicks on the email, and consents to it, this flow would be recreated for Sarah. Now the beauty is that all the connections would run under Sarah's account. So Sarah has a copy of this flow. Bear in mind, if I make any changes to the flow, it won't be reflected in Sarah's flow. I would have to send a copy again. I can also go ahead and export this flow. So I can export this flow as a zip file, move it into a different tenant, different environment, or share it with a different user. Once again, in this scenario, all the connections would run under the context of the user who would then import this. And the way to import a flow right here under my flows, you can just go and click import. And this will ask you for that zip file, which you can upload right here and import it. The next important tip is around the flow run duration of 30 days. Now bear in mind that a flow run times out after 30 days. So from the starting point of my flow, which is my trigger, to the last action in my flow, I have 30 days for this to complete. Very common use case are approval scenarios. Here, I have an approval task. Now what if my user does not respond for 30 days? Well, in that case, after 30 days, the flow itself will time out, and that approval task would be void. So you would want to handle those scenarios. One way of handling them, if I go to the settings for the approval action in this case, I can even define timeouts for my actions. And right here, you have to plug in your timeouts in ISO 8601 format. There's also an example given here P1D, so that's one day. If I specify P20D, for example, that's 20 days for this action. And what happens if this times out? Well, let's say I wanna send an email. So I can use a send an email action, then define when I would like to send this email. So I would like to send this email if the previous action has timed out. The last tip is around the flow run history. Please note that your flow run histories are maintained only for a period of 28 days due to GDPR requirements. Now for my flow here, I can see the entire history, but only a 28 day run history. If I go to all runs, I can see all those runs and I do have an option here to download a CSV file so I can keep a record of all my flow runs. Now this is a manual step that you have to take. You can even automate this using Power Automate Desktop. And lastly, a bonus tip to close out this video. When you create cloud flows, be it automated, instant, or scheduled, those flows will be listed out under cloud flows. 
as long as you are the owner of the flow. If you add a secondary owner to the flow, or if someone else adds you as an owner to the flow, those flows will be available under shared with me. If you enjoyed this video, then do like, comment and subscribe to my YouTube channel. And thank you so much for watching.